Thanks. Okay, so for chapter 23, vascular disorders, right? So when we, when we say vascular disorders, what are we referring to, guys? Like the circulatory system? Yeah, circulatory system, right? And so particularly, um, we're talking about arteries and veins, right? Um, and so that's the way the chapter sort of divided up. We'll talk about arteries more specifically first and then, and then veins. So again, just a little bit of background, right? To kind of remind us about this. And again, I'm sure we've, we've learned about this in anatomy and physiology, um, probably one. But in terms of right, the structure of veins and, and the function of veins versus arteries, right? There's, there's major differences. Um, so in terms of which vessel, which blood vessel is going to carry blood away from the heart? Arteries or veins? Arteries. Yeah, arteries. And in general, that the blood that's in arteries is going to be well oxygenated, right? Because we're, the, the body is delivering that, um, that oxygen to the body's tissues, right? So the, the blood is coming out of the heart fully oxygenated, right? Um, and then, and if you, if you look down here, right, so that blood moving through the arteries, it's going to end up, if we're talking about delivering the oxygen and the nutrients to, you know, the tissues or to the body cells, right, that's going to happen via capillaries, right? So these are very small blood vessels that have lots of, and there's lots of surface areas in these capillary networks, right? And basically the oxygen can leave those small capillaries, right? And then carbon dioxide can come in, right? Nutrients, other nutrients will leave the, the capillaries and enter that interstitial space so that, that cells then have access to it, right? And other waste products will be taken back up into the blood vessel, okay? And then once that, that oxygen's been delivered, now that blood is gonna be unoxygenated, right? It's not gonna have as much oxygen because it basically was given to the body's cells, okay? Um, and so then we're going to, you know, blood is going to be returned back to the heart through veins, okay? If you look at the structure of arteries versus veins, what's the most noticeable difference, I guess, between the two? Ooh, wow. What's the most notice noticeable difference, just even from that picture there? The thickness of them and veins have valves and arteries don't. Yeah, good. Veins have valves arteries don't, and also the thickness, particularly the thickness of what layer? It's the middle one, but I don't remember the name for it. Well, what's, in, I mean, it's, it says it here, right? But what's in that middle layer is, is that smooth muscle layer, right? So, yeah, so um, that's kind of what I was getting at. It's just that we know that, understand that there is much, um, a much larger smooth muscle layer in arteries versus veins. And why is that? Somebody else, why? Why, are, why do arteries have this really thick, smooth muscle layer compared to veins? Because they need to push the blood to where they need to go. In the arteries? I mean, well, so you probably kind of meant this, but the arteries, the arteries don't really need to push the blood. Why? Because there's lots of pressure inside those arteries, right? So the blood is kind of flowing that way because there's so much pressure inside the arteries. So why do you think it needs to have that thick wall? I mean, it has to do with withstanding the pressure, right? Obviously, it's going to give it more strength, okay? Um, and if there's a lot of pressure in there and you talk about, we know that arteries can constrict and relax, right? It needs to be strong to be able to do that to withstand that amount of pressure that's in there, okay? So that's the main reason. Um, and so, yeah, you know, and then all that, that blood's going to get delivered to all the parts of the body. But again, it, there's lots of pressure in there. So it really doesn't have any problems getting where it needs to go, right? Um, but that's different in, than veins, right? So veins are going to return blood back to the heart. I mean, in particular, if you think about, you know, returning blood back to the heart from your lower extremities, right? And you're talking about vessels where there's not much pressure in them, okay? they are reliant on valves, right? And also skeletal muscle too, right? So skeletal muscle and these valves really are um, really important in moving blood back toward the heart, 
okay? And, and towards the end of the chapter, when I talk about um, disorders that affect the veins primarily, you can have leaky, right, valves that don't close properly. And then the blood will back up and it can start to pool there and it creates major issues, okay? Um, so if these valves are not functioning properly, that blood's not gonna be able to move through the veins and get to where it needs to go, right? And, you know, ultimately be delivered, you know, get back to the, to the heart. Um, so those are kind of some main differences. So those are kind of some things to keep in mind, right? Things that we probably learned about at one point, but just to kind of remind us, okay? Um, obviously, all tissues are dependent on the vascular system for survival. I mean, we just, I just talked about that, right? Um, the blood that's moving through the vascular system, through the arteries and veins, is what's going to carry oxygen, and, and, and that's basically how your cells and your tissues are going to get oxygen and nutrients, okay? Um, if you have a lack of sufficient blood, blood flow, it leads to things like hypoxia. We talked about this before, okay? And also buildup of waste products. All right, so let's move on. Just some other kind of terminology and sort of basic info here. Um, if we talk, and we've, we've used the term perfusion before, right? Perfusion, perfusion just in general means basically the movement of, of blood through the blood vessels. Um, you can divide it up into central perfusion and local perfusion, okay? Uh, so if you're talking about central perfusion, blood flow pumped by the heart into that entire vascular system, okay? So it's really based on um, cardiac output, right? How much blood that, that heart is putting out and then also that the blood pressure is maintained in, those, in that sort of central perfusion part of the vasculature. Um, if there's something going wrong, some sort of pathologic process, it's going to affect the entire body, right? But if you then think about local perfusion, right? So now this is, this is kind of thinking about capillaries, particular specific capillaries that are serving a, a specific region or organ of the body, a, a, in a pathologic condition there is only going to affect specific tissues, okay? So um, you can kind of think about it in those sort of two different sort of categories. Okay. Um, if we talk about peripheral vascular disease, okay, and we're gonna talk about that um, throughout this chapter, these are conditions that will affect um, circulation in tissues other than the brain or the heart, okay? So we're talking about in the, in the periphery. Okay, outside of the brain or the heart. Um, specifically, you can talk about peripheral artery disease, which obviously is going to pertain to the peripheral arteries, okay? And the most common issue to talk about there is arteriosclerosis, okay? And we'll talk about that. Um, some common types of diseases are things that are gonna affect the veins. Again, I'll talk about those later. Um, chronic venous insufficiency, okay, deep vein thrombosis, leg ulcers, varicose veins, those are all, are all particular disorders that will affect the brain, um, the brain, the veins, okay? <laughs> okay, um, so in terms of risk factors, right, the, the big ones that I'm sure we all could come up with on our own, yeah? Smoking, hypertension, coronary heart disease, these are all risk factors for peripheral vascular disease, okay? Um, also risk factors for um, you know, heart attack. I mean, you can see these kind of work, you know, sort of vice versa of each other. I mean, I guess if you kind of think about coronary heart disease, um, an issue, a peripheral vascular disease or like atheros atherosclerosis is going to put you at increased risk for coronary heart disease, okay? So these all kind of work hand in hand with each other. High cholesterol, we'll talk more about that. Diabetes, um, family history, Obesity and being sedentary are really big contributors to this as well, okay? Does anyone have any questions so far? All right, so some concepts that are related to um, impaired perfusion, right? So some, any sort of pathology within that vascular system. Um, cognition, obviously, if you're talking about a lack of blood flow to the brain tissue. And, and that we talk about that in chapter 27, okay? Um, comfort and pain. So particularly, if, even if you, think of, if you think about some of that like deep vein thrombosis and some of those um, disorders that affect the veins, they cause pain. They cause pain and swelling and, and redness, okay? 
um, fluids, electrolytes, acid base balance, those are all going to be thrown off if perfusion is not happening properly, right? If you're getting pooling of blood in a certain area, fluid starts to leak out, right? Um, if, if certain area of the body, were, whatever, you're not getting enough oxygen being delivered, levels of carbon dioxide go up, right? That, that then affects the pH of the blood, okay? Um, nutrition, oxygenation, these are all concepts that are related to vascular disorders as well. Okay, and so that's exactly what this is showing you, right? So here's perfusion or impaired perfusion in the center, and these are all concepts that are related to that, okay? Um, I think I pretty much, I talked about most of these, okay? Um, like I said, we'll talk more about this aspect of it when in chapter 27, okay? Chapter 27 particularly, you know, focuses on um, the, the brain and the spinal cord, the nervous system, okay? All right, so let's talk specifically about peripheral arterial disease, okay? So now we specifically talk about the arteries um, and arteriosclerosis, okay? So arterial, arteriosclerosis, I can only say it a couple more times without mispronouncing it, um, is the more general term, okay? So arteriosclerosis means thickening and loss of elasticity of the arteries and also calcification of those arterial walls. So basically, um, the arterial walls become compromised, okay? Most often, this is because of plaque buildup, right? And so um, arterial sclerosis that's caused by plaque is called atherosclerosis, okay? So it's not a typo, right? Um, I, I can't spell very well, but this is not a typo. Uh, oftentimes, you'll see that these two terms are used interchangeably, even though they're not technically the same term, okay? So when we talk about plaque, what are we referring to, right? What the heck is the plaque made up of, right? Cholesterol, calcium, and any other substances that will sort of harm in that arterial wall, right? Other lipids, okay? And we're gonna talk about that a little bit more, all right? Um, in terms of risk factors, same risk factors, okay? Um, smoking, hypertension, high levels of cholesterol and LDLs, and also high other high levels of other types of lipids like triglycerides, okay? Those are all gonna part, put you at increased risk for atherosclerosis, okay? Um, all right, so like I said, a little bit more kind of about lipids in general. So cholesterol is a type of lipid, right? Um, triglycerides, fats, those are also a type of lipid as well, okay? So if we say that somebody has dyslipidemia, that just means there's an abnormal level of lipids, okay? It could be either, be either high or low. Um, most often, especially obviously when we're talking about atherosclerosis, we're gonna talk about hyperlipidemia, okay? So you have uh, elevated levels of blood lipids. And remember, cholesterol is a blood lipid, triglycerides are a blood lipid, there are other blood lipids as well. So again, if you wanna specifically talk about high blood cholesterol and high um, triglycerides, hypercholesterolemia or hypertriglyceridemia, okay? Okay, again, these are all different types of lipids. Now, the way that lipids move around in the blood um, are in, in complexes, okay? So they move around the blood um, in, in what we call lipoproteins. So basically, these are complexes of proteins and other lipids, and that's how, say, cholesterol moves around in the blood, okay? And depending on whether cholesterol is associated with LDL, low-density lipoproteins, or high-density lipoproteins, right? that's gonna dictate its behavior, okay? So LDLs are bad, right? The bad cholesterol. And these are the, this is the type of cholesterol that's going to promote atherosclerosis, okay? So remember, this is the, when, we, when we're referring, referring to the LDL or the HDLs, it's referring to what's carrying the cholesterol around, okay? HDLs are good, they help clear cholesterol from arteries and they actually transport it to the liver to be metabolized, okay? And again, just another reminder that triglycerides are fats, another word for fats, okay? Um, if you look at this table here, this is basically just showing you, right, uh, both cholesterol and triglyceride values 
um, you know, normal, optimal, desirable, borderline, high risk, and very high risk, okay? So having high levels of LDL and, and or high levels of triglycerides are going to put you at increased risk for the, you know, deposition of plaque in your arteries, okay? And atherosclerosis. Okay, so do we need, we don't need to memorize these numbers, but I mean, you know, general, I, you know, we should know that if your, if your LDL levels are, you know, getting close to 200, that's a major problem, okay? Total cholesterol itself is not that informative, right? You really need to know LDL and HDL levels, okay? So same thing for with total amount of triglycerides here. There's a very large range here of high risk, but again, it's kind of that 200 number, okay? Um, all right, so just to continue a little bit more about this, kind of now the process of atherosclerosis, what actually happens. It's not just that the cholesterol or the fats just stick in the artery and that's it, right? If that was all it was, it wouldn't be as serious, okay? Unfortunately, it triggers a whole cascade of events, okay? Um, so it says here that the atherosclerosis will actually begin when the endothelial cells get damaged. So again, if we're talking about the lumen, you know, the opening of the artery and the wall, there's endothelial cells that line that, right? And so the plaque can sort of deposit there. And like I said, it sort of leads to this whole bunch of cascade of events that ends up damaging those, those endothelial cells, right? And then, you know, you have inflammation that gets promoted. Um, and basically a whole bunch of other things kind of end up sticking along with that plaque, okay? So if you, if you see here, this atheroma, where the plaque is, it has, there's calcium deposits there, there's macrophages, there's other lipids, right? And then there's actually connective tissue that kind of surrounds it, that anchors it there, right? Um, <clears throat> like I said, this does induce an inflammatory response that then causes smooth muscle cells to proliferate. We talked about this with the respiratory system, right? I think particularly with asthma, um, that that, inflammation actually causes more smooth muscle cells to be produced, okay? So if you have a larger or a larger amount of smooth muscle cells in the wall of the blood vessel, it's going to make the opening smaller, okay? Um, those smooth muscle cells also secrete extracellular matrix proteins that help stabilize that plaque. So it really anchors it in there, okay? Um, all right, and so obviously if that atheroma is you know, sort of sticking out in the luma, it can impair circulation, okay? Um, and so if you guys kind of look here, you know, this is basically showing you this atherosclerosis here in a large coronary artery, right? And you can see that this is constricted here because of it. Um, and again, it's not just hanging out in the middle here, it really gets embedded in the wall. And again, you have connective tissue on top of it, a whole bunch of, um, a whole bunch of processes occur to really anchor it there, okay? Um, what else though is an issue? And I think this is kind of on the next slide. So sure, it's all well and good if it, it's sort of there, right? In this one spot. Now over time, this will kind of keep accumulating, right? And inflammation will get worse. Um, and it'll, it'll probably this area will get worse. But what else could happen, you think, to this plaque or this sort of initial atheroma that, that formed? What else do you think can happen here? What do you think? Can pieces of it like this large and move to other places? Yeah, good. So yes, that's true, right? Piece of it, and that's, that's when maybe it becomes, you know, even more of an issue because if this is a large artery, right, and you have a little bit of occlusion going on, all right, maybe that, that's fine, right? Um, as long as it doesn't get large enough. But what happens if a piece breaks off um, and then what happens, it gets lodged in a smaller artery? right? And where it can actually block blood flow completely. Did somebody put something in the chat? What the hell's going on here? I don't know why. One second. Let me just, if I could pull the chat down, it would be awesome. Um, so yeah, so that's one of the, the issues. One second. I don't know why it's not um, letting me... Um, Oh my goodness. Sorry. Uh, I see your message, Winterlin. Let me go back. I don't know, I, I, I thought somebody had a question about the, 
lecture. Anyway, if you have a question, just unmute yourself because apparently I, I can't get to the chat. I don't know why. <laughs> um, all right. So in terms of major consequences, right, is one, what we just talked about, okay? If it breaks away, it lodges in a smaller artery, it can block blood flow completely and lead to a heart attack, right? It could also lead to a stroke. And I'll talk about stroke again in, in chapter 27. Um, it can just lead to peripheral artery disease. Um, like I said, you can have that rupture, okay? Um, if, if, you're, if you want another term here, right? So atherosclerotic stenosis. So this means that plaque that's there, it could eventually start really blocking that artery, okay? Or like we said, it could rupture and it could end up somewhere else and basically block it and cause an infarction, okay? Um, so those are kind of two of the major kind of issues that can happen. Um, you, you would call a plaque that has the tendency to sort of break apart a vulnerable plaque. Now, usually these types of plaques have more inflammation and they also have a thinner fibrous cap. And so those are more likely to rupture. So in some sense, it's better if there's lots of, um, you know, sort of connective tissue in that extracellular matrix that's secreted to kind of keep it there. Um, if there's not, it will have more of a tendency to break away, okay? Um, some other manifestations that can occur as a result of, of, this, of the plaque or of atherosclerosis, um, aneurysms. So I'll show you a picture that has um, some examples of different types. Also, arterial dissection can occur where you actually get tearing of one of those layers and the blood vessel actually splits. Um, and then again, you can basically occlude that entire artery. Okay, um, so let me, let me just show you this. The other thing is I did, like I told you guys in the beginning of class, I did add a few sort of details to some of these slides, including some notes, okay? So in terms of some of the different types of aneurysms, um, mycotic here, okay, and saccular, there's some little bit more clarification. Let me just see if I had anything else down here. Um, yeah, so, and also a little bit more on traumatic there because they're really, it wasn't really clarified anything anywhere else. So I just wanted to make sure it was in the notes for you. So if you talk about mycotic aneurysm, mycotic is sort of a little misleading because that refers to a fungal infection. But in fact, a mycotic um, aneurysm can be caused by any type of infection, bacterial or viral as well, okay? Where it's going to um, disturb or um, damage the wall of the artery and it leads to this sort of weakening and this bulging. Okay, um, so anytime we talk about an aneurysm, right, it's just a bulging of a weak arterial wall. That's all aneurysm means, okay? Now, there are other things that kind of can happen as a result, right, that aneurysm can rupture, okay, and that's a, that's a major problem, um, and I believe I talk about that a little bit more in chapter 27 as well. Um, if you talk about a saccular aneurysm, apparently this type of aneurysm is the most common cerebral aneurysm, okay? And this is really just on one side where you see this bulging. And again, what happens when this bulges, right? That wall is weak um, and it's damaged. And so it can eventually burst, okay? Um, atherosclerotic aneur aneurysm is caused by what we were just talking about, that process of atherosclerosis. If you're talking about a traumatic aneurysm, what do you think that's caused by? It's in my notes, but why doesn't somebody else tell us what, what's the traumatic in aneurysm caused by? Somebody tell me. Is it hemorrhoid? Right. Oh, an example yeah. would be like shaken baby syndrome. Yeah, I mean, it's any kind of traumatic brain injury, right? Shaken baby syndrome, definitely. Um, so any, somebody said, I think, head wound. But yeah, some serious sort of head wound. If you actually have a skull fracture, pieces of that skull can actually really penetrate and directly damage the blood vessel wall, right? But it also could just be due to pressure and stuff like that that's induced by the injury as well. Okay, so that's an aneurysm that's caused by injury. Um, and then remember I mentioned that dissection, that's what this picture is showing you here, right? You get the walls kind of separate from one another and the blood can basically get in between the walls. Not, not, not good, pretty, pretty major issue, okay? Um, all right, oops. Okay, so in terms of diagnosis, right? Checking pulses in the extremities um, to make sure that the pulse is okay in those extremities. If it's not, then it means there's maybe some sort of blockage somewhere. Um, 
if you're talking about lab workup, right, um, knowing if, if the patient has diabetes and also lipid levels, super important, right? Um, you can do a treadmill test with an EKG to see if there is some sort of compromised heart function, right? Um, also, this ankle brachial index, and again, maybe you guys have talked about this in, in your physical assessment class, but you can compare the blood pressure in the arms with the blood pressure in the ankles and, and it indicate that you have diminished circulation in the legs, okay? Again, indicating some sort of peripheral artery disease going on, right? Um, you can actually use ultrasound to, to actually um, see as well, right? To even see plaques. So um, I remember one year when the, um, the director of the medical imaging program at Rutgers came to talk about our articulation agreement. He actually brought his ultrasound machine and he, um, he basically imaged his carotid artery, right? Um, and you can actually see if there's any plaque there. Um, and he said he wouldn't be able to do anyone else's, but anyway, you can, it's a very easy, like I said, he just had this portable ultrasound machine and he could just do it on himself and, and, and we could see that. So ultrasound is, is um, useful in actually visualizing what's going on. Um, you can also, if you wanted to get a better, clearer picture, there are contrast dyes that can be injected into the arteries to be able to see it even better, okay? So if there is some sort of um, artery, peripheral artery disease or um, indication that there might be plaque buildup or something like that, you may need to do some, some imaging techniques. Okay, in terms of, um, we got another question here. Oh, okay. All right, thanks um, for letting me know. All right, so in terms of treatment, right? Lifestyle changes. Obviously, there are medications that you can take to lower blood cholesterol levels. Um, there are other medications besides statins now, but that was kind of, that's kind of the main one. Um, you may need surgery, right? Um, if you're talking about an included artery, you're talking about a heart attack. Um, angioplasty and a stent may need to be inserted, right? Um, and actually, obviously, if, if you're having a heart attack, it's pretty, pretty um, important that you get that patient in right away to put that stent in, right? And, and basically open up that artery um, if it's almost completely blocked. Okay. Um, I think, let me just say what else. Yeah. So this is the last part of, of this. And like I said, what's already up on Moodle picks up after, after this, okay? So now if you want to talk about anything else that's basically um, not related to atherosclerosis, okay? So like I said, that's probably the last time I can say it without mispronouncing it. So blood flow is decreased for reasons other than plaque buildup here, okay? So some examples are um, coartication, I can't say that either, of the aorta, which just means narrow aorta, and usually this is just a congenital defect um, that's picked up early on. And so if that aorta is narrow enough, it may require surgery, okay, and the placement of a stent. There's also something called thoracic outlet syndrome, and I'll talk more about that. Um, and that particular area becomes narrowed. So I'll show you a picture, um, it's on the next slide, and what we're referring to there. Um, and this can actually be caused just by excess muscle tissue. It can also be caused by obesity and also fluid buildup during um, fluid retention um, that occurs often during pregnancy, okay? Another example is something called Raynaud disease, okay? And so the small arteries in the arterial, arterial, arterioles in the fingers mostly, right? In the extremities, the fingers and the toes will actually spasm, okay? And then that will restrict blood flow there. Okay, so often patients will have like really white fingers um, or even you can see cyanosis, right? Blue sort of fingertips and things like that. And one of the big triggers is cold weather. Um, and also emotional stress can trigger this as well. Okay, so we'll talk a little bit more about that as well. So in terms of this thoracic outlet, right? Where is it? It's, you know, it's kind of right here, right? Um, you can see this is your, this is your clavicle. Um, and then this is right your shoulder joint here. Um, and so you can see the blood vessels, right, veins, arteries, and then also nerves that are in this particular area. And so you can imagine, you know, if you have really, you know, really big muscles or, you know, these really big bodybuilders that you might see, it will restrict the amount of the area that's there, right? Basically, the muscle, the muscle tissue will start sort of impinging on this space, okay? Also, if you think about just posture, right, if we're all day like this, 
okay, that's going to basically make less space there and can lead to things like tingling down your arms, right? Pain, okay, mostly down that affected sort of that arm, okay? Um, and also the tingling could be because of decreased blood flow, but also because of affecting the nerves that are there as well, okay? So that's what we mean by thoracic output, okay? Um, and so just to go a little bit more with this, because I just kind of said these things, if you talk about, again, thoracic outlet syndrome, it's that you have poor blood flow and decreased nerve function as a result of that, of that sort of restriction of that area, okay? Um, and I think I pretty much mentioned most of these already. Um, if you're taught, I think I already said this too, in terms of that narrow aorta, it depends on the severity of the deformity. If it is narrow enough and there are, you know, symptoms that are occurring, it's going to need to be repaired surgically, okay? And usually that's by placing a stent in there. Um, for Raynaud's, I think I already said these clinical manifestations as well, pale skin, cyanosis, numbness, tingling. Um, if it's severe enough, ischemia could result, right, and, and lead to tissue necrosis, okay? All right. Um, in terms of, again, the narrowing of the aorta, you, you can kind of get an idea about this with blood pressure um, readings. However, I would imagine obviously also some imaging techniques would be necessary to see actually how narrow the aorta is, right? So this obviously isn't the only way to diagnose this, okay? Um, and um, this might be something that's really picked up early on, okay? Say in an infant. For thoracic outlet syndrome, um, mostly it's a patient reporting symptoms like that. I have pain, I have tingling down my arm, right? Um, and a lot of what you would do to alleviate it is basically physical therapy, okay? Um, and you can basically kind of do this maneuver to, to, to figure out if that's really where it's stemming from, okay? So that's what this ADSEN maneuver is talking about. Um, and then obviously you would want to look to see if, if blood flow is actually impeded there. Okay, so I kind of already talked through this as well. For thoracic outlet syndrome, it's physical therapy, okay? Because um, it's really usually, it's, 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 it's caused by this decrease in physical space for those, for those blood vessels and the, the nerves there. Um, for Raynaud's, a lot of, most patients won't see treatment. Um, they'll just sort of avoid triggers like the cold weather. Um, if, if necessary, they may need to take anti-inflammatory medications or even calcium channel blockers if, if it's sort of serious enough. But usually they kind of, um, it's these sort of rain outs episodes. It's not a constant thing, right? So a lot of times they don't seek treatment. Okay, so like I said, that gets us to what's already up on, on Moodle, okay? Um, and the next section focuses on diseases that are specifically, um, pertaining to the veins, okay? And then also blood pressure is the last part of this. All right, guys? Um, let, does anyone have any questions related um, to anything that I just covered? All right, one other thing that I just kind of a couple things um, here. Um, I mean, they're, everything, is, I mean, make sure you listen to the whole um, lecture, but also, just to kind of remind this figure here, what this is, what this is depicting, right, is that if we talk about control of blood pressure, it's under both hormonal, right, or endocrine control, which we talked about, right? If you guys remember this, some of this should look familiar, right? Remember we talked about this renin angiotensin, right, system here. Um, so we have aldosterone here, we have antidiuretic hormone here. We talked about these things, okay? And, and the way that they're going to alter blood pressure or increase blood pressure, right, is by increasing blood volume, essentially, right? If you're talking about taking in more water from the level of the kidneys, it's going to increase blood volume, which then increases blood pressure, okay? Um, if you're thinking about really kind of the sympathetic nervous system, right, and the sort of nervous system intervention here, um, it's it's basically there are receptors that exist in the blood vessels in the walls of the blood vessels to signal to the nervous system that there's a change in blood pressure okay and so norepinephrine release you know or norepinephrine neurons okay from the brain stem will actually directly um basically cause um constriction of those blood vessels okay so just say so again just kind of make sure you review this 
The other thing that's at the end of this chapter um, is this diagram that really, that, that summarizes the mechanism of action uh, for different hypertension drugs, okay? So kind of two figures that I think are particularly sort of important to, to pay attention to, okay? All right, um, I'm going to stop the recording so that that way I can just put up that lecture there without having a whole bunch of other stuff. So let me just do that and then I can.